everyone, and welcome to the sixth and final episode of Shine a Light for International Women's Month. I'm Chloe Finley Walker, Marketing Insights Manager, and today we've got with us the delightful Tanya Weller. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Chloe. I'm really excited for us to sit down and have a great chat about all things Women at Samsung, International Women's Month. But before, for those that don't know you, can you just tell everyone a bit more about yourself? Um, yeah, so um, I started Samsung three and a half years ago. I was brought on board to launch Samsung KX for a Saturday. Amazing um, space. The most amazing, amazing project that I got brought into to kind of launch. And um, yeah, so, so kind of um, proud of what we achieved here and the whole team and, and so forth. But yeah, so, so sort of came into Samsung um, to launch Samsung KX. And then since then, I've um, had a couple of different roles. I was um, marketing director for D2C and I've just moved over to the DA team now. Um, so really fortunate to kind of have, um, I guess, a, a varied career within Samsung already in, the, in those three and a half years. Um, prior to that, I was agency side for 12 years. So I worked across a whole range of brands from Diageo, Heineken, Coke, um, Microsoft, O2, Netflix, all loads of different brands. Um, had a really, really fun time agency side, you know, was kind of young in London, yeah. having, <laughs> living the life, pre-kids, pre-husband. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a brilliant kind of, I guess, training ground for really sort of integrated marketing, um, worked across loads and loads of different campaigns and then made the move um, in-house um, just before Samsung, actually, to Merlin, who own um, Alton Towers and Thought Park and London Eye and so Love forth that. and walked, w worked across a couple of different attractions um, before coming to Samsung. So a kind of a not very, not very linear. I think a lot of people in Samsung have always worked in tech, have always worked in big tech companies or telco or whatever. And I'm... Um, yeah, I have agency side, I worked in entertainment, and now I'm kind of at Samsung. So, um, yeah, kind of quite quite varied, um, but I think I've, I've enjoyed that about it, to be honest. Yeah, that's really great. And I just want to talk more about your journey in Samsung, because like you said, it hasn't been linear, and you've kind of jumped around from different roles. So I think it would be good to just speak about, we all know Samsung can be quite a difficult business to navigate. So how you kind of navigate and navigated and opened up those experiences for yourself, it would just be good to know more about that. Yeah, so I think um, I was really, really fortunate that Samsung KX involved um, loads and loads of different stakeholders across the business, um, all the divisions, HQ, EO, et cetera. And um, yeah, I was really privileged that I kind of built those relationships with many people across the business during the sort of two and a half years I was um, in charge of kind of King's Cross. And then I think I was really looking for a new challenge after two and a half years. I kind of launched it, I was super excited, but I'm, I'm, I don't like to sit on my laurels. I kind of like the new challenge, the, the new thing. And I was really keen um, to learn more about digital. I think my digital expertise wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, and I kind of reached out to Nick White at the time and sort of said, you know, is there anything going in your team? And then um, DTC was kind of forming. So it was very much kind of, you know, understanding what you wanted, understanding where my development areas were, understanding where I kind of wanted to kind of, yeah, understand more about the business, learn more, um, you know, progress my career and, and reaching out to the people that I thought would be um, relevant and that could support me. So, I mean, I had conversations with Nick for a number of months before anything came of it, but I was just really interested. I was, like I said, wanted to develop more sort of digitally and commercially. Um, so I started in D2C uh, after I left about two and a half years um, or so. And then, and then Dan Harvey actually reached out to me on, on DA, obviously. Um, they needed someone over there. And um, I'd had an amazing kind of eight months or so in D2C um, and probably shorter than I anticipated. But actually, um, the opportunity in DA was brilliant. It, was, it, was, it gave, gave me a lot of breadth. And I think the D2C team is brilliant. And I'm super excited about um, the kind of the ambition behind D2C. Um, but the DA role just gave me a bit more breadth. And again, I've never done channel marketing before. So I'm now suddenly, I've got a retail team and a channel team and a training team. And so for me, I always look for opportunities where I can learn something, to be honest. Um, so yeah, just started in that role and I'm really loving it. Well, congrats, Thanks. first of all. So I think as well, you've spoken a lot about the opportunity that you've had in terms of like your day, your day-to-day -day role. Um, but if for those that don't know, Tanya is the founder and chair of women at samsung so i'd love to speak to you more about that and more just to get guess like what made you want to start women at samsung how that came about and kind of like what that offers you um that's different to your day-to-day -day role and i think look um so like you know i've said before i'm really excited about women at samsung i think it's probably i guess a couple of years maybe no but a year and a half ago or so yeah. um and um yeah, we were talking to HR a little bit of time about sort of some of the DNI stuff that we wanted to sort of raise in the agenda. And I sort of put my hand forward and said, I'd be really happy to 
you know, build a women's network. I think at the, at the time, I think during the pandemic, you know, again, with KX being the kind of essential team, but it also then sort of felt like you're quite detached and almost a bit of an island. So I remember having those conversations a lot with how do we kind of get in with the divisions more, but you're not in the office. So how do we, how do we kind of understand what's going on? And I guess, you know, selfishly, I was also thinking about what my next move might be and how I can kind of network a bit more on the business. And, you know, I was very aware as well that in lots of meetings, I, f- I felt like sometimes the only woman in the room or, and yeah, it just became really apparent that we were kind of missing, missing this sort of piece of the puzzle. And if you look at a lot of our competitors or um, other big brands we work with, like, you know, Microsoft or Facebook and Google, and those people, they have really strong women's networks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, we, we started this and, and it's been brilliant. I mean, I've, I've got so much pleasure out of meeting some incredible women like you, um, and just being able to, I guess, take a step away from the day job and really think about how we can support building a stronger culture in Samsung as well. I think, you know, sometimes we, we often struggle sometimes with, with how we fit in with the, the culture overall and how we can improve it and make it more diverse and so forth. And I just felt like I wanted to do something really, um, and actually, it was a great opportunity. And, and I, I've, like I said, I've absolutely loved it. I mean, the, the women we've met, some of the impact we're already making, um, you know, we're talking about it loads. We, we, there's loads of great initiatives that we've got underway um, and loads and loads more to do. And like I said, as for me, as long as we're kind of trying new stuff or learning new things or, you know, opening our eyes to, um, I guess, new opportunities, yeah, it keeps yeah. me excited. It gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah, for sure. I love that. So the theme of International Women's Day this month is about breaking the bias. Mm -hmm. What does breaking the bias mean to you? I think for me, um, and having recently been on conscious inclusion training, I, I think it's just about opening our eyes to people being different from each other and, and embracing that. And I think sometimes we have a habit. Um, and it's human nature, as they say, we want to surround ourselves with people that are just like you, right? And and it's human nature because, um, I guess to a degree, there's some sort of, I don't know, validation or it's like, it's like when they say you, you, um, you fancy people that look like you, right? Or you, (laughs) you know what I mean? That kind of thing where they kind of go, it's like a sort of, like mirroring, it's mirroring, right? And you mirror people. And I think what, what, uh, yeah, so what it means to me is really just trying to get out of your comfort zone and, and surrounding yourself with people that are, that are different from you. And, 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 and there's so much research, and there's so much um, um, insight around, you know, diverse teams. Um, yeah, create, create far, far, far better outcomes. Yeah. Um, so for me, breaking the bias is literally about just being really, really aware of the people you surround yourself with. And, and actually... Um, trying, trying, trying to break that that habit almost of, of perhaps that's something that feels quite natural, yeah. but to kind of yeah to kind of break that and kind of go hang on a minute this feels a bit wrong. I'm surrounded in a room of people that all look like me and sound like me. We're not going to get a particularly diverse opinion here, or yeah. we're not going to get an opinion that's representative of our consumer or whoever. So I think for me, um, yeah, just being far more aware about it. I think for me is about how we break the bias. Thanks, that's great. Could you tell us more as well about any experiences that you've had relating to gender bias? I think, um, look, I think everyone has such individual experiences as, as, as women, as, uh, you know, as, as whoever. I think for me, um, I think, um, and and maybe it's my personality, you don't know, right? But I think I'm, I'm often, people often look to me to kind of, um, sort them out and you know bring the cup of tea and you know where's the water and and kind of the host and I think again it's my personality and I perhaps naturally fall into that but you definitely become aware of it and I think you know um when I was agency side as well you know you'd often be hosting clients and things and you know everyone would look to me in the room to kind of get the tea out and be handing out a tea or taking the notes and that sort of thing you're thinking And, and the weird thing is it doesn't stop the more senior you get it just kind of carried on and so I think to start with, you sort of think, well, you're the sort of junior person in the room, so you'll do that. And it was kind of quite old school, I guess. But yeah, I think that sort of thing has probably stayed with me throughout my career that I always feel like, and I don't know whether or not it's me instigating that or people sort of generally looking to you, but generally trying to um, look after people and yeah. be that kind of motherly figure or whatever it is that's sort of associated with women that should feel like we have to, you know, yeah, post. Yeah. If I you find like. it so interesting that you said that that hasn't changed the more senior that you get. Because I think maybe when you're in a more junior position or at the beginning of your career, 
you would expect it to change. So yeah, it is an interesting point that you've made and perhaps it does like lean into maybe like gender stereotypes, but also like you said, into personality types as well. So that's like a really interesting point that you made there. So just bringing it back to the break the bias theme, what do you think that workplaces and big corporations can really do to start really taking a big step to help and break some of these biases? I think for me, it's just, it's considering people as, as individuals, right? I think sometimes corporate environments, and I get it, right? We all have to create policies that are for everybody and, and, for, and that kind of across the board. But I think the more we can tailor and individualise, um, I guess a lot of our policies, the better they will be because yeah. ultimately you're, you're sort of, you're considering people on an individual basis. And I think that's the thing is everyone has, everyone makes their own choices. Everyone has their own individual experiences. And I think for me, I'd love, I'd just love to see us more thinking about, and that we're sort of doing it with ERGs to a yeah. degree, right? We're yeah, kind of creating starting. communities and networks of like-minded people. And for me, I think sometimes a corporation has to encompass such a wide range of, you know, people's, like I said, belief systems and values and, um, you know, backgrounds and ethnicities and gender and all this sort of stuff, that it kind of gets diluted. And actually, I think if you can create um, these communities whereby we can, I guess, provide more of a voice to the corporation, to HR, to whatever, to say, well, hang on, as, us as a team of people, us as a group of people, that these are sort of our needs. And even within Women at Samsung, you know, we've been talking even last week about how there are some new returners, men and women who have returned recently from having a baby. And actually their needs are slightly different. And actually we're setting up like a mini community within Women at Samsung, where actually they can talk and, you know, share experiences and so forth. And that's a, a huge value, I think, to find like-minded people. So building communities, but even micro communities, whereby we can, I guess, make a difference and influence um, Samsung, um, you know, the corporations to, to listen to more um, individual needs, I guess. Yeah. So International Women's Day and International Women's Month is all about celebrating women, uplifting each other and really being supportive of each other. Is there a moment either in your career or in your personal life where you've really felt uplifted and empowered by other women or that you feel like you've really just almost empowered yourself? Um, I've got loads. I've got loads of examples actually. Um, I've got. I'm going to give you three. Love that. Um, okay. First one. I was at Merlin. We were doing a Women at Merlin Day. Um, all loads of women at Merlin. And actually, to be fair, the entertainment industry doesn't necessarily have um, the gender imbalance that perhaps tech businesses do. It's it's actually um, pretty pretty inclusive on that front. But there was a lady called Fru Has Hazlitt who used to be. Oh, she was the first female CEO of Yahoo. She worked at ITV, like loads of big entertainment brands. And she, I think she went into ITV after um, a big shake-up. There's, it was mainly men in sort of in charge. And um, she talked, she got up on stage. She's, she's not exec director of, of Merlin. She got up on stage and she talked about, um, she's, she's bonkers. She's, she's loud and proud as a woman. And she used to say, if you want to walk into a boardroom and have jangly bracelets <laughs> and wear high heels and ask those men about their weekend and what they did with their kids, you go ahead and you do it and do it. And she was really like, she was very empowering in terms of as a woman, be yourself and be proud of being a woman. Yeah. You bring so much to the boardroom, you bring so much to the meeting, you bring so much to the party, just be really proud of it. Um, and then she talked about at ITV, um, she was there about four years, I think. And every week she used to send an email to like, I don't know, thousands of people. And her name was Fru. At the end of email, she's, you know, the CEO of the company. She signed it with two kisses. Yeah. Um, and she was like, if I want to send an email with two kisses, I'm going to send an email with two kisses. What's wrong with that? And on her last day, um, some people were emailing, it was her last email. And they said, and someone said, oh, dear Frux, we're so, like, we're so gutted you're leaving. Your emails have been so amazing. And she actually, someone thought her name was Frux <laughs> because... Because no one would ever believe a CEO would put kisses on the end of her email. Yeah. And I just thought, you know what? To get to like CEO of a company and to be so kind of, you know, she was so, so proud of who she was and she didn't have to alter and change anything. I just thought it was absolutely brilliant. That is funny. Um, <laughs> but she was amazing. I was on a panel this week with um, Boz St. John, who's a CMO of Netflix. Loves her Who is goals. amazing. Yeah, love Serious her. Serious goals. And also <laughs> felt really underdressed because I was in my house, literally in like a sweatshirt. And she was like in this like glamorous outfit. And she talked about, I said to her, 
how do you really support women in the, how do you how do you support getting women in leadership positions and, and kind of um, you know building those succession plans and so forth and she said what we need to do as women is find our allies find other female allies and really and I sort of talked about cheerleading and so forth and she said she noticed a pattern at Apple and Uber where she was at before Netflix that men used to um, call out other men in meetings and kind of and big them up right. And she was like, why aren't we doing that? So she said that she found a network of women in Silicon Valley where she would go to meetings and she would just basically big them up. And she would talk and in, in, in a substantial way. It wasn't like just they're amazing. So yeah. you've got to do it with some substance. And she said, um, I used to go into meetings and then and reference these women and talk about what they were doing, what projects they were working on, what report they'd written, the great insight they'd discovered or whatever it was. And she said, other people were doing that for me. And she said that eventually it started to pay dividend. People go, oh, I heard your name in a meeting the other day. And so it's amazing. She said, build your network of women, find your allies around you and support each other. So true. And I was just like, that's amazing. And then my third one is just, I've got the most amazing set of girlfriends. And actually all through my, like, um, from school, from university, and even my local mums now in Woking, I surround myself by really strong, amazing women. And I, I get my kicks from just hanging out with them because I just love and they they empower me yeah. because I'm just I feel so, I feel invincible when I'm surrounded by them you know because I've got my girlfriends they've got my back I've got theirs and I've always been um yeah I've always had really strong groups of female um yeah women in my life that I've just loved and embraced yeah I love that and that speaks to like the importance of having great women around you at work and professionally but also personally as Absolutely. well it really like they almost do like different roles for you but ultimately still make you feel just yeah. as empowered or uplifted in those particular exactly. situations and we're always there for each other in the whatever the whatsapp groups of stuff that's going on in people's personal lives and there's always someone chipping in with brilliant advice and great and just i think i don't know i personally need that and i think it's amazing that we have that i'm really lucky i love that it's been great speaking with you. We've just got some final questions that we just want to ask you before we wrap up this entire series, actually. Um, so the first one is, what advice would you give to your younger self? I never have a good answer for this. This is, this is a good question. Really good question. Um, I think for me, I, I know I talk too fast. I interrupt people a lot. Uh, I, there's a lot of things that I do that I really have really tried at. And all through my career, I've been told the same thing. And I've really tried to almost, and some, and sometimes I, sometimes I get better, sometimes I don't, but like I've tried to almost like fight against my personality. And I think I've got to a certain age where I'm like, I'm kind of who I am and I, and, I, and I wish I could tell my younger self, don't worry, it's okay just to be you because actually I've got to a point where I'm like, you've, you, it's either this or, because I, I, I can't pretend to be someone I'm not. And I think I tried a lot to really be, loads more considered and really a bit more reserved in certain points of my career and I, and, it, and it's really difficult for me because I have to it's like fighting against the natural instinct so yeah I just wish I could tell my younger self just be just be you and don't worry about it you'll find you'll find a way and actually you'll find the company that wants you to be like that or you'll find the culture or you'll find the group of you know people that want to be surrounded by you because yeah, for sure. you kind of are who you are in some ways so yeah just embrace your true self and then the final question is, in three words, what does gender equality mean to you? Um, I'm rubbish at these answers, Chloe, because I don't have three amazing words to tell you. But <laughs> um, interestingly, and, I, and I'll tell a, a, a short story, but my daughter is six years old. I'm currently reading her the Girl Rebel book, which is sort of heroes, all these incredible women have done these amazing, yeah, done these amazing achievements from Amelia Lockhart to whoever and she keeps going when are we going to talk about the boys when are they going to page on the boys and it's like she doesn't see it she does not see gender inequality she just thinks they're all equal so for me I just would love for us all to be six-year-olds again because the reality is it isn't an issue it's a non-issue in her eyes and actually I really hope it is a non-issue for her at six years old I hope that by the time she gets to my age it is, it, and, it, and it's never an issue for her. And that's what I hope, and, and that's what I believe gender equality is about, is that we all are six years old again, and we don't think it's a problem. You know, she, does, she sees boys and girls exactly the same in her class, and I don't think it is yet hit home to her that she might face some differences as she, as she gets older. Um, so I hope that we can, yeah, I don't know, 
put ourselves in the eyes of a six year old and think about gender equality in that way because we didn't I don't I don't think it's six years old we realized yeah and but I also hope that my six year old can can live in a world that is that is far more equal and that she never ever has to come across some of the challenges that 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 you and and some of many women face today yeah I love that. And I love that for your six-year-old daughter. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, thank Tanya. You for and it's just been an amazing way to end this series. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this series and really looking forward for you to see what we've got in store next.